gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Source Material. I am your host, Jesse Starcher, and joining me for the first time since, man, I think this is the first time since I've returned from my hiatus, Mark Radlich has joined me for the Source Material Comics Podcast. Mark, you know the schedule better than I do. Have <laughs> we have we, have we we joined each other uh, in a Source Material since I've returned back from the hiatus? No, you threw me in the pool and said, I got this, go away. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> People have asked me, they're like, hey, are you still doing comics? There's this comic I'd like to talk about and I'd like to talk to Jesse. Like, I don't even, I just cut him right off. I'm like, this is Jesse's department. Leave me the hell alone. I'm not doing this anymore. Mark. I've did it for a year. I am done now. Thank I am you done. very much. I have done my bit for God and country. Oh, man. Well, again, I can't thank you enough for picking up the flag and the banner of source material and continuing through the whole, practically the whole year, uh, if not a little bit more, that uh, I had to endure as an essential employee and I had to cut back the old podcasting. But I'm back. I've had a few episodes under my belt by now, for sure. This time, we're going to be talking about a book that you had requested. There's a new movie coming out. It's a prequel to the the two Kingsman movies okay. uh, that came out. And those Kingsman movies were adapted from the Secret Service book by Mark Miller, which we're talking about tonight. Yeah, I've not seen the movies. I knew it had been based off of a comic. So I assume, obviously, that's why you wanted to talk about it, because it's tying in with the upcoming movie, correct? Yeah, um, I don't uh, I'm not looking at the schedule and you know we were i'll tell everyone how the sausage is made jesse starts these 20 years before they go to debut um and just you know leaves them in a can and is like oh they, they marinate they <laughs> marinate is what happens yes he you know he likes to make sure all, all the wine and spices get in there for these shows so uh we are doing this in conjunction with the king's man i will tell you as we're recording this i have actually not seen any of the two kingsman movies yet oh me either I know. I think this is a Matthew Vaughn series of films. Matthew Vaughn directed some of the X Men movies. I think he did the X Men prequel stuff. Again, I'm not looking at the wiki or anything. But long story short, I wanted to read the book before I saw the movies. Now, this is ten years before the you know the movies come out because time travel. But now, after doing this podcast and reading the book, I will be well prepared to see the first two movies that we're doing a long road to ruin on, and then be more than prepared for the prequel, The King's Man. That's right. And I've heard good things about the movies from. From, uh, a few of the people that run in our circles. So mm-hmm. I've always wanted to sit down and watch them, but I just haven't had a chance. But, you know, written by Mark Miller, Dave Gibbons, the artist known for his art on Watchmen and co-plotted by Matthew Vaughn, colored by Angus McKee. So there we go. That synopsis is coming up. But first, let me talk about Amazon Music. If you're looking for a good platform that can fill those musical needs, Amazon Music has you covered. If you head to getamazonmusic.com slash W2M Network, you can get a free 30-day trial where you can check out over 70 million songs. That's getamazonmusic.com slash W, the number 2M Network, for that free 30-day trial. I'm going to do something a little different here on the synopsis. Instead of breaking down everything issue by issue, I'm just going to give you a big general back page blurb that I created then you can listen to Mark and I talk about the finer points of the book that we enjoyed. Gary is a young man with a rough life on the wrong side of the tracks, just trying to make it by living with his mom and brother in an abusive household. After seeing him deal with the similar struggles of his own past, Gary's uncle Jack London takes interest in him, believing Gary to be a great candidate for the same super spy program that he is a part of, and also motivated to take him out of the living situation Gary is in, Jack gets Gary to enlist. We follow Gary as he goes through all of the training to become an agent, only to be thrust into a plot by an eccentric billionaire with a plan to kill five billion people that goes to some of the highest spots in England's government. But can Gary overcome his personal demons to become the hero that the world needs to save the day? We find out in these six issues of Secret Service. Let's talk about our protagonist first, okay? Okay. Um, let's talk about what your thoughts are on Jack London. Look, you needed a mentor character. You're going to need someone who's going to, you know, bring Gary out of his circumstances that are a part of his little origin story and be that mentor to him and then inevitably pass the torch. I mean, the thing about the, the Kingsman uh, Secret Service book that we're talking about is it is very familiar in structure. It, you know, we have a guy who's down on his 
luck and he's an heir to well. He gets a, the one in a million opportunity to better himself. And the mentor kind of brings him along and he makes some mistakes and has some discomfort along the way. And then the mentor goes down, right? The mentor gets shot. And then, you know, and then Gary, you know, and then the, the pupil, the student, the Padawan has to then step up and, you know, t avenge his mentor's death. You killed my teacher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then and save the day. And then he ascends to greatness. It's the hero's journey. The hero's arc, as Joseph Campbell has taught us all in the hero of the thousand faces. So, you know, but your question was, what did I think of Jack London? Jack's great. Jack is one of the better mentor characters I've seen in, in this in this familiar type of storytelling here he recognizes that he has not done right by his family and he sees the writing on the wall he sees the the train going off the track and he is like well i can't do it for him but if he would just reach for greatness i can maybe give him a boost yeah yeah and so I, he does I, yeah i like what you're saying there it's it, it, this guy who came from i guess you would maybe say the wrong side of the tracks mm -hmm. made his way up is now working for or I believe it's MI6. I know MI6 is mentioned in here. He's working for some type of covert agency for Britain, which most likely is MI6. But regardless, he's very much a James Bond character, but he's grown up from not the greatest childhood into a man who is respected, a man who is very good at what he does. But what I really enjoy about him is that he doesn't forget where he came from and he doesn't forget the people who he grew up with. Now, granted, him and his sister are not on the best of terms. Uh, Gary's mom and, and Jack are, are not on the best of terms, but Jack sees something uh, in his nephew, Gary. He remembers what he was like and he sees, I think most most likely he sees himself in Gary, wants to bring him up, get him out of the situation that he's in and trying to get him you know, he, he wants the best for his family, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Even though he's this international man of mystery, he wants to help his family into a better situation. Or at least he's come to a realization now in his life that he needs to be a part of his family and help them out. Jack's your quintessential James Bond guy. I was a little surprised at how sexual this was. Like, oh, like, oh we're going to teach you how to shoot guns. We're going to teach you how to plant bombs. We're going to teach you this. We're going to teach you that. And we're going to teach you how to find the clitoris. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. My, yeah. you know, and, but you're right. You know, and I, and that triggered, not triggered, but triggered my thought about like how James Bond, they tried to make him right down to the most important thing you need to know about James Bond is he bangs vaginas. Oh, just he ever, <laughs> you know, just like, he's just, just banging women left and right like drums and it's and it's like they don't necessarily make him a cad or even you know like misogynistic per se the women he sleeps with in this book all want to sleep with him and isn't like my friend's joke about james bond you know you know or family guy you know a thousand no's and one yes means yes like you know like like you know the like he sleeps with the bad guy's girlfriend and she wanted to be there she she's yeah. into it you know what i mean yeah and i was surprised by that because again i'm not used to seeing such overt like sexual content in a comic book i guess apparently i read the wrong comics but uh but what I, but it, it, but they didn't necessarily make him like shitty about it you know what i mean yeah i mean it was obviously a means to an end but it's not yeah. like he he didn't say last night was great why are you still here yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah yeah jack is the he's it's james bond all over i mean this book is james bond all over they really took like the the james bond or structure and aesthetic and was like okay but what if it's the boys you know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's it, yeah it's not as over the top as the boys but it's definitely right. like we're gonna let you in on some things and it's you know it's the seedy kind of things that you you may think about as well in, in regards to James Bond. Uh, I guess enough about Jack. Let's talk about Gary. The, I mean, he's really I, I, he's the main centerpiece of this book. Gary, uh, I don't know if we get his last name or not. He's he's Jack's nephew. Growing up again on the wrong side of the tracks, living with a, a, a mom who has a really, really bad reputation for picking the wrong guy. You're talking to a social worker. This is just me all day long, man. This is what I deal with. There was so much about like that family in this book that I have had to deal with personally in my profession. And so like you have the mom who clearly has some mental health issues going on and like about mental health issues, like I said, can be the slightest of anxieties to, you know, the harshest of 
you know, psychosis you know, mm-hmm. and all things in between and, be, you know, and behavioral disorders, personality disorders. And so it's clearly this mom has a lot of self-esteem issues. She doesn't believe she is good. And so she's, you know, and, and she obviously has been left to deal with these children on her own, which, you know, which causes its own degree of issues. And so she's mm-hmm. reaching out and as women in the situation tend to do, she's pairing up with these ne'er-do-wells and, you know, who beat her and everything. And I was actually glad that they didn't totally make her a defenseless, you know, wallflower, you know, who gets a black eye and then, well, it's my fault for burning the meatloaf. You mm-hmm. know, at the end of the book, the stepfather, husband, whatever the hell he was, beats her and she makes a point of saying, I gave as good as I got. Yeah, yeah. You know, which I liked, you know, because it's like, you know, women, as we all know from the, the Lorena Bobbitt story, sometimes women have had enough and will defend themselves. Yes, so. they will. <laughs> they will take matters into their own hands. With and scissors. Yes, they will. <laughs> <laughs> my mom did marry a guy who was kind of abusive at some point um as sometimes Sorry. and it was the good thing is is that she wasn't with him for very long it was probably into uh for about four years i think from, from like three to s- when i was six or seven she mm-hmm. and she left um uh, maybe maybe eight but anyway so we're talking about four or five years that kind of struck a chord with me obviously you, you got gary who's a teenager at this point if if not i would say he's definitely a teenager or in his early 20s at the very but he's still living at home and he does not like what's going on with with his mom he doesn't want to see his mom beat and i i understand from what i understand his you know stepfather his mom's husband whatever boyfriend beat him as well and they have i i don't know if that boy is their kid or if it's an if it's another man's kid but you know he's got a younger brother he's kind of worried about as well you you feel sorry for gary because he wants to get out of the situation he has the opportunity to get out of the situation and of course the neighborhood and everything that he's growing up in really influenced him a, a good portion of this book spends time on the evolution of Gary as a as a person going from the broken home that he's living in to finally finding some structure. He doesn't believe in himself, just like his mom. You know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. These are clearly abused and neglected people dealing with self-esteem issues and let level, you know, um, issues of self-worth. And they and there's the degree to which that they believe that this is all that they are worth and what they deserve until, you know, until push comes to shove literally, you know, and they have to do something about it. But I think the other side of that is, you know, and they talk about like, it's like a goodwill hunting situation where Gary is actually really talented and really smart, but due to his mental health issues, due to his environment, due to his behavioral things, points it all in the worst directions possible. Yeah. But, but there's so much potential there if only somebody would guide him. And that's yeah. that's what the the book is obviously, you know, an action-oriented book, but that's what's going on in the subtext. Absolutely. Jack comes in and he, he takes Gary and puts him into some structure. And then we watch Gary, you watch these, yeah, Party the trainers, fingers, these yeah. people in authority are watching, they're, they're watching Gary and they're like, man, this guy is good. You know, this kid is good, but you're not going to be able to take the hood out of the boy might be able to take the boy out of the hood but you're not going to be able to take the hood out of the boy and Class, they see that classic structure in this kind of storytelling you have all the naysayers you have all the doubters it's almost like a family guy thing and you know and how almost exaggerated it is it's like oh you're you're not what we're normally used to dealing with clearly this can't you know and then yeah. you know it's like jack black whoa <laughs> you're not my normal butler you know? <laughs> i fu- i find you irreverent and therefore like you like that sort of stupid thing yeah. but it works you know um we you know i think we we gravitate towards stories where we have likable characters that we want to see do well and you know and cheer for it the thing i like about him and this is you know this is like the mary sue argument right you know people it's okay to be good at something naturally there are people who are naturally talented at certain things and ascend when given the right opportunities, but it's their own sort of mental stuff that keeps them back or, you know, yep. or classism that affects them. And, you know, and, and these are sort of, you know, chicken or the egg situations. And so what I'm talking about is despite his talent, he still fucks up because the, because the other recruits make fun of him. Yeah. You know, I love the scene where they're going into the club and the idea is yes. a training exercise. It's 
pick up a girl basically and what, whatever merit picking up a girl does for you when you're on a mission that is that is the exercise that they are uh practicing in this environment right that's right yeah yeah you know and so they're all dressed to the nines and you know in hats and tails and he walks in looking like eminem and he's like <laughs> but this is going out where i'm from and it's like Ugh, <laughs> yeah. please go home white trash and he does <laughs> too is what's funny because they end up having these little spy pins and they leave one on and of course they're kind of talking about how he dressed and they forgot that he could hear everything and of right. course that upsets him and he's like all right fuck it i am going home and he leaves the club and st- steals his uncle's james bond's car uh <laughs> with all the gadgets and then like takes his buddies out for a spin as americans we look at like the british and i i, I guess to a degree because there's still like lock stock and smoking barrel out there and you know like cockney british but i think for the most part like we think of british we think of like classy you know we we, we think of properness and this book is all about ne'er do well, gangster, shitty, yeah. white trash British guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's yep. so funny. It's so many of the social, psychosocial, political, social issues that we deal with in this country. It, it, it's one of those books that kind of that, that really does remind you: everywhere has a class of society. Everywhere yeah. hates poor people. Everywhere hates minorities. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, it, just because it's another country and it's not the minorities you hate doesn't mean they don't hate their own minorities. You know? That That's right. Thing. Of course, every story like this has to have a bad guy, uh, has to have a evil villain, a <laughs> very evil villain, a guy who is planning on killing five billion people by using cell phones. <laughs> I Do- Dr. Arnold, I, I believe. Is his did, name. Were you having utter Thanos vibes during this? Oh, absolutely. So the motivation, the crux of what this villain wants to do, he's been so obsessed with the fact that our world is going to come to an end because of carbon emissions, because of global warming, because of humanity's hand, that he was like, oh, you know what? If we just wipe out five billion of the people and leave one billion left, everything should reach balance. And that word was used, if I remember correctly, in the mm-hmm. in the story. Balance was one of them. And uh, so Dr. Arnold is this evil guy who's going to use the cell phones to emit what they call the frequency. I put that in quotes because I didn't know what in the world it was called at first until it was finally used, I think, in the second to last issue. But uh, the frequency, which is going to basically make everybody that hears the frequency murder each other. That's and a great plan. As far is. as like evil plans go, like I'm going to change the frequency frequency in cell phones that everyone's have so that it you know so that it turns on your rage button and you'll all just kill each other and he's not like malevolent about it he, he's very practical he's like look if we don't but by, by by the way agenda much if we don't <laughs> change course behaviorally in this world we're gonna have massive floods and i really like the idea of i don't know how much sound science there is the theory is that Due to it in industry and pollution in the environment, the earth is now reacting as you would as if you had a virus. You you know, humanity and its industrialization is causing the earth to be sick. The earth is reacting in kind. And how does the earth react? Through natural phenomena. Uh, floods, uh, hurricanes. Floods. I could not remember the word flood. Earthquakes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to the degree that that's true, that is what they say is the reason why we've had such bizarre weather over the last couple of years. I know, like, you live in the uh, the Arctic tundra that is Ohio, right? <laughs> so, so didn't you have to deal with, like, the nor'easters that drop, you know, 100 feet of snow and some shit? Yeah, I mean, that was back in the day. Uh, and you're mm-hmm. right, because I've clearly noticed a change in weather when it came to like uh, winters, for sure. Right. I mean, there, there was one winter, I swear it may have snowed like, I don't know, six inches all winter mm-hmm. and that was not like what it used to be um, and they, um here in florida like you know we're known as hurricane country but because of allegedly because of global because of climate change it's changing the ways in which the oceans work and therefore it's causing weather pa- weather patterns to shift and now the hurricanes aren't hitting florida as such they're more hitting the gulf the inside of the gulf or they're hitting the mid-atlantic area more so than they ever have this is why new orleans keeps getting hit with hurricanes mm-hmm. yeah so this throws Dr. Arnold uh, into this. Hang on, can we talk about that for a second? Sure. This book op- this opens with Mark Hamill. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he kidnapped. So- 
when the opening line of the book is, hey, what did you think of that of those prequel movies? I honestly wanted to stop reading the book. It's too much like real life, and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if people I, have heard me say that enough on my own podcast that deals with pop culture, but I hate everyone in pop culture, and I hate everyone in podcasting, and I hate trailer reactions, and I hate conversations like this one. Yeah, Dark, Dr. Arnold's like, okay, I, you know, we, we got this calamity that's going to happen. I've got this plan. I want to kill five billion people, but I want to rescue. I want to save the very famous actors of all his favorite programs. Right. Uh, starting with all, you know, movies. And uh, we're also talking about television shows. And they name drop people left and right in here. I love uh, and I love how Jack figured it out. He was like, oh, that's right. He would have been growing up when these people were famous. Duh, that's the connection. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, this guy's a, this guy's a geek for crying out loud. No wonder he's going to so save. He's sa so he's saving the directors of his favorite and actors of his favorite movies. He's got Mark ha Hamill. Uh, I think Pierce Brosnan, I think, shows up at one point yeah. makes a James Bond joke near the end. Yeah, um, Ridley Scott is the one where he finally figures it out. <laughs> Yeah, Ridley Scott. He's like, oh, okay, all right. So, yeah, so that's Dr. Arnold and his motivation. So he's just, he's just, he's wanting to end the world uh, or at least change the world. He wants to he eliminate the, he wants to eliminate most of the people. He wants to do Thanos. You yeah. Know, it was, it's literally the same logic as Thanos, which was we have to eliminate half the people of the universe in order to save it. And he says that about the Earth. It was like, we, if I eliminate 5 billion people, then there'll be less people which will have an impact on the environment and therefore the earth will be saved. Honorable mention here. I will, I will throw a shout out to gazelle, which I think I've seen either in the posters of one of these Kingsman movies. Gazelle is the guy is the, the right hand man with the, oh, what are those called? Mark the prosthetic legs. Yeah. Um, uh, and they're like the curve shape so you can run well, I guess. And his name is gazelle, or at least that's what Dr. Arnold calls him. He, he's like the super agent that was at one point part of the secret service or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's kind of helping Dr. Arnold out, but uh, I'm throwing, I'm throwing him a shout out there because he, you know, he's obviously helping him out. He's a formidable foe at the end, Gary and gazelle are going at it and he meets his end with a, a pen laser knife, pen laser knife, Mark Radlich. My favorite interaction from him is when he's talking to Dr. Arnold at the, uh, it's at the facility. He's like, can you like maybe ease up on the names? You know, don't, call me gazelle all the time <laughs> you know i got the legs i understand but uh, and i guess dr arnold has a problem with that he apparently is calling a bunch a bunch of the other guys names that are just i don't want to say inappropriate but he just feels like calling people like the one guy with a patch he's calling cyclops and i remember when he called talks to him the cyclops guy's like could you maybe not call me cyclops because i you know i kind of hurts my feelings a little bit but uh, that's kind of all i have on the characters were there any characters or anything that you wanted to talk about that i missed uh, I, I you know i hit the main ones mainly I didn't think there was anybody else other than what we kind of talked about already. No, I uh, I generally enjoyed the book. Um, it was a fast read. I didn't get bogged down in, bogged down in it. It's it it felt a little bit deep a, a little bit deeper than the typical action comic fair, but maybe not as deep. I don't know if this is saying anything like the boys did or Jupiter's no. legacy did. There is a heart, a heart to it. I remember that being one of the comments I was reading about mm -hmm. this book is like Miller can get to the heart, even though all this insanity is going on around here. There's still a bit of a heart to the actual story. And I that's kind of what I saw in it. No, I agree. Um trying to get away from doing the typical Marvel DC superhero stuff. I mean, a lot of the comics that we review is stuff that has been adapted into movies and television shows. Um, that's why we're, that's why we're talking about them, but I have definitely tried my best, especially while, while you were essential to dig into a lot of the independent stuff, especially with writers who worked for one of the big two, but then went to an independent because you can absolutely say this is something I talked about with Sheehan, uh, November of 2020, when he picked all the books and he picked fucking weird ones. <clears throat> you can see the freedom. We, you know, we make jokes about all these wrestlers defecting now to AEW, and they're just so happy that they're not in the controlled environment of the WWE. And whether or not this is this was published under one of the big two, maybe one of their smaller imprints, or you know, or whatever the case may be, this definitely feels like Miller just had a run of whatever it was he wanted to do. It was just like, yeah. make this. We're we're not worrying about you, we're not worrying about this being at the sales level of Spider Man or the Fantastic Four or the X Men. We're just happy to have you do 
do whatever you want, do what makes you happy. And he was like, okay. And then what I was saying before was like, you know, some books like The Boys or Jupiter's Legacy, they have an agenda, they have a, an editorial point of view. There's something they're saying about the state of the world. And this one is a little bit of that. But I think for the most part, he just wanted to write a really fun action story that was definitely for the older comic book readers. This didn't feel like he was going for a mainstream audience. He was going for the middle-aged guy who still reads comics and wants something that's going to get his dick hard. The, and so, you know, an action adventure that pulls no punches, but actually is written rather intelligently for the medium that it is. I think he was successful. I, yeah. really, I really liked it. I gave it, uh, I think on Goodreads, I gave it like a four out of five stars. Like it wasn't the last Christmas, which is fucking perfect. Um, <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was definitely one of the better things I've read this year. You know, I've definitely read a lot of like three star and, and some two star stuff. Uh, well, OK, let me ask you real quick before we close things out, because yes, sir. give me your favorite moments. You got any favorite moments of the, from the book? Um, I like when he takes the stepdad out. I think it's a very triumphant moment for him. That's um, the best is the is the bar. He, you know, he is surrounded and it's always, you know, like work smarter, not harder, you know. And so he knows he can't just fight a gang of guys, especially the ones that are all bigger than him. And I think one of them might have even had a weapon. So he yeah. uses one of his gadgets to immobilize them. He just takes them out one by one. <laughs> and that is one of those like, I don't know if that's in the movie, that scene. I, I hope it is because it's a great bit. And just the opening thing with Mark Hamill, only because like, Jesse, can I talk to you for a minute? Oh, talk to me. Tell me wh tell me why you're hurt, Mark Radowitz. The mindless, stupid, incessant speculation about bullshit drives me insane. I watched a Marvel movie. I wonder what direction. Dude, no one knew what direction they were fucking headed. Okay? <laughs> every time somebody assumed what direction Marvel was headed, they always went in a different direction. And every time someone said Mephisto, they said dick joke. Yes, so, they did. <laughs> so that's Marvel. And that's why it's like pointless to speculate about all this stuff. I remember, and I know I've told you the story, but here, here's another example of this that isn't having to do with stupid Marvel. So the Matrix 2 ends, right? And it ends with Neo having superpowers in the real world, which makes no sense because he only had those superpowers in the Matrix, in the Matrix right? Yep. right? And despite Robert Winfrey's contention that it does make sense and I'm a dope, it doesn't and he's a dope. And here's okay. why. Okay. Because he shouldn't have had superpowers in the real fucking world. Th that is not the physics of the world that they created. Mm -hmm. And But it was such a bizarre idea. And we all kept wondering, like, how does he have those powers? And so I remember my friend at the time, like we did this in the middle of Disney World, by the way, we were like online waiting for rides and stuff and to get into shows. And we just would not stop talking about the next Matrix movie and what it could be. And we came up with great, wonderful, interesting, entertaining, plausible ideas of how Neo could have had superpowers in the real world. And you saw the third movie. That didn't make a lick of sense. Nope. And it wasn't nearly as interesting as anything we came up with, you know? And then I think like, I think at the time, like Neo was either dead or unconscious or in a coma or something. And they were like, what's that all about? And we were trying to come up with great ideas. Anyway, the point is the more you mindlessly speculate, the more you get let down when whoever's in charge of these things does the exact opposite of what it is you think they're going to do. <laughs> yeah. And so he's just, and so he has to now, in the middle of kidnapping Mark Hamill, has to complain about the prequel movies. And it's like, fucking shut up already. <laughs> just shut up. These things were a million years ago. Get all, get over it. You ruined my childhood. Please walk in the traffic. Mark Hamill says, could we please just get to the point here? Why the hell did you <laughs> kidnap me? I, that was the best. And that's why I brought up, like, you're like, what's my favorite part? Mark Hamill being like, I'm done with you nerds. That's what. <laughs> Yeah, like, I mean, I don't want to talk about the jobs I got as a young man actor. I want to know why you're kidnapping me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm with you, Mark Hamill. That is the truest part of the book. Well, I will tell you, this book had its moments where it swerved me pretty good. Um, okay. okay, so Mark Hamill by page four after he's getting rescued, maybe page five, six, I don't know, where he's mm. getting rescued by a secret agent, proceeds to die on panel when <laughs> the guy's shoot wouldn't open up right. And as the kidnappers are, well, some of the kidnappers who have survived are following this. They watch this secret, this MI6 agent. And it was so funny because they're just kind of watching him as he falls down the, this ravine. And he's like, the bad guy kind of lifts his glasses up. And he's like, I don't think it shoots opening up right. And then they die. Mark Hamill <laughs> and the MI6 guy die. And I'm like, wait a second. He just killed Mark Hamill. Now... <laughs> 
I, I want you, you know, to remember that as was the first time that they swerved me. The one big swerve was uh, Jack going to answer the door. Y- you are led to believe this whole comic that Jack London is this fantastic, unbelievable MI6 secret agent. And then mm-hmm. he gets killed by looking through the peephole of a door. Yep. And then we find out it's on accident. They didn't even know it was him. Like they were just upset. Like Dr. Arnold was upset because his woman, he followed the woman. He thought he was, she was screwing around on what she was, but you know, he doesn't even know it's a secret agent in any way. Life is so fleeting. yeah. <laughs> Well, and that's brought up a couple times in the book. Like, you know, mm-hmm. anything can happen. Mark Hamill just bit it in the first issue. Uh, so right. we should have known. Well, that's, that. when I, that's when I knew we were in for a good time. They were yeah. like, OK, this book is like the, the gloves are off. There are no rules everyone's you know donald duck in it with no pants we're just here to have some fun you know this isn't like a typical marvel or dc book where we're like well we can't really kill people because you know sales like yep. no this book mark miller like just had a palette and he painted and that's what i like yeah yeah and then my, i think my third and final favorite moment the best moment of that final issue when gary finds dr arnold he asks him about what he thought of jack or something like that and dr arnold says who and then and he's like, fuck you and pulls the trigger and blows his brains right the fuck out. <laughs> and I was like, yes. All right, sweet. This is this was a good time, even though there was a lot of like, oh, my gosh, moments. You, you talked about the moment where Gary was in the bar with his uh, his mom's boyfriend and the rest of those thugs. And I was like, what I thought was going to happen was that he was going to get humbled. I yeah. thought he was going to go in there and Mark Miller is going to humble him and he's going to crawl out and he's going to be bleeding all over the place. And then Jack's going to pick him up and then he, Jack will go take care of business. But no, that's not what happened, which made me smile. And I was like, OK, that's pretty cool that it, this was a lot of tension, but a lot of happy endings. I have one. I have one more favorite part when he goes to pick up the girls and he says, like, something along the lines of, you know, he's trying to incorporate the lesson that he learned, which is, you, you know, be insulting, but also be complimentary and sort of find a place in the middle. And so he's like, hey, you're all five, but I'd still bang you. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. and I'm like, they're gonna do the thing where like that works. See, they're gonna make this idiot like successful at this. And nope, they they no. did what would really happen, which is he's not successful, and then he gets his feelings hurt, so he goes for a joyride and nearly bucks up everything. Oh, and uh, of course, at the very end, when before Doctor Arnold meets his meets his demise, we find out that they rewired the weapon so that instead of <laughs> 19 <laughs> minutes of hate, everybody wants the bone for 19 minutes. Oh my god, I honestly was like. Oh no! You know, <laughs> and that's and it's handled so funny because like like they shift over to like a hospital scene and you know and like the nurses and you know, and the doctors are all railing each other. Oh yeah, but like the pa- but it somehow has no effect on the patients who are like, can I just get a glass of water? <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll close up shop here, Mark. Why don't you uh, go ahead and tell us what's uh, what we got on the schedule? Uh, if you can, hopefully nothing changes. <laughs> Cross our fingers and knock on wood. <laughs> Hey, it's plug time, and you all know what that means. This will be a good time to plug the sponsor of the W2M Network, and that is Grammarly. For you, the listeners of Source Material, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. To download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M network. Again, that's getgrammarly.com slash W, the number two, M network to download Grammarly for free. I'm just going to tell everyone um, this is, in theory, debuting on um, Sunday the 19th, whenever you might be listening to it. We will have a long road to ruin for the first two Kingsman movies. We will have a Daniel Hollywood for the new The King's Man. You know, shortly after that comes out, we have um, some Spider-Man, a lot of Spider-Man stuff. Jesse took over the entire month of December with Spider-Man comics. One Ooh, Spider-Man yeah. comic. Oh, get ready. Je- Jesse was like, I need all 30 days of December for this. We are going 
going into the Spider-Verse. So check out Jesse's series on the Spider-Verse parts one through 100. <laughs> um, that, that it will be, it will be the largest series that mm. we've ever covered on the Source Material Comics podcast. Mm. Um, just check us out on wherever you happen to be hearing this. If this is not where you normally would listen to podcasts, we are available on Spotify, Apple, Amazon. Uh, we have an entire link tree in the description of this podcast. You can click on and you can pick your poison. Um, if you like to see, uh, now this is good. Now, obviously, this is audio only and there's no video for this, no accompanying video. But um, for most of our shows, we do do video um, for all most of our movie reviews. There's video tele, TV show reviews. There's video. Uh, and that's all on YouTube on the W2M page. So please like, comment and subscribe. If you leave a comment, I will mo- I will at the very least give it a thumbs up. You know, if there's something I can interact with, if you have a question or a comment or you're just trying to engage us, I'm more than happy to engage with you. So like, comment and subscribe, especially the subscribe part, wherever it is you like to listen to this stuff, whether it's YouTube or one of the podcatchers, subscribe to us. And that way you'll get all the new shows. And maybe you don't like all the shows. Maybe you like only just a few. You keep the ones you like. You can delete the rest. That's what I do. You know, I, oh, I, I uh, you know, there's is some people I, there's there's podcasts that I like, but I don't like everything that they do. And I delete the ones I don't want to listen to. It's not that hard. The last thing I will say is if you are an Apple podcast subscriber, more than anything else, leave a comment on our Apple uh, subscription page. There's one comment. It's one guy who went, what the heck? It's been there since before I was. Was officially part of W2M. I just want that comment to go away. <laughs> so I don't care if it's I hate you. Well, I hate you too, Rattledge. That's fine. Something us other than one star. What the heck? What the heck? I'm okay with the one star part. It's the what the heck I have issues with. So please leave a different comment. <laughs> All right. All right. Anything else there, Mark, before I get into mine? Because I am I think I'm just going to be... Uh, uh, be the beauty part about this is I could post edit credits right in here. You know, any any other plugs that I want to do. So, but No, I wanna... I've listened to our shows. Our plugs are 20 minutes long. It's ridiculous. That's it. <laughs> I've done. <laughs> he is done. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, go check out uh, everything that Mark talked about here make sure if you wish to follow me you could do so at stiznarchy on the twitter uh, i do also another show called unspoken issues focuses on 90s comics so if you uh dig that uh check it out i'm sure we got plenty of episodes up here that are in the archive right here on the w2m network so uh with that being said for mark radlich i am jesse starcher we'll catch you next time have a great one bye-bye Thank you all for joining us. Make sure to give that Rattelich in Broadcasting Facebook page a like to stay up on top of all the great podcasts we have to offer. We are at home on Spreaker, but you can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and recently we have hit the air on Spotify. Find your favorite podcast platform and type in R-A-D-U-L-I-C-H to subscribe for some great content. If you enjoyed this show, please feel free to share and spread the word. And as always, we appreciate any feedback and look forward to entertaining you again soon.